Oh yes, we ha come to those chapters in, uh, I don't know about this, I'd better put it on anyway. So those chapters where he talks about Isaiah, we're not going to read all the Isaiah chapters. They take up a good deal of, of the book here, of 2 Nephi. But he gives his explanation. That's what interests us, of course, here in chapter 25. So let's start at chapter 25 where he gives his explanation of Isaiah here, which is very important for his understanding these things. Isaiah spake many things which are hard for the people to understand. Notice Isaiah himself often mentions the fact that the people ask him to speak smooth things. He wants him to, t they want to hear smooth things. I'm not going to teach you smooth things. He said, if I just gave you smooth things, you, you wouldn't need them. I just gave you what you want. The scriptures told us only what we wanted to hear. Of course, we wouldn't need them. So, uh, and you notice it all changed under the rabbis. The interpretations become different. Notice Isaiah is much too literal and so forth. And, uh, and then, of course, they accepted the university uh, abstractions and, and became a more philosophical and intellectual interpretation of everything. That happened after the fall of the temple. But the temple hadn't fallen in Lehi's day. And but the people were these hard for my people to understand. And, of course, he's, he's talking about his own people now. They had a, an even harder time because they didn't know the manner of prophecy among the Jews. Now, prophecy is a special idiom. There are various ways, and he's going to tell us about here that he's, he has the special type. He does not follow the, the uh, established lines of prophecy, which have to do with chants, incantations. They have to have a special meter. A prophecy has to be pronounced in, in a certain rhythm and so forth, depending on where you find it. That's what the oracle is. Weisheit Raunen Ran Sein Gewell, as uh, the Norns, where, where, where their oracle is. Raunen, they speak in runes, they speak in rhymes. When you're inspired, you're, you're swept away. And this is a sign, supposed to be a sign of inspiration, to speak in that. And the inspirational language, well, in, in a Greek tragedy, for example, which is a religious play, the dialect, the common people speak in, in uh, the Ionian dialect, the dialect of, of Attic and so forth, the Attic dialect, I should say. And uh, whereas the choruses, which are inspired words, they speak in Doric, in, the, in an old archaic language. And, and uh, the Egyptians call always write in two colors, as you know. They have the rubrics, which is their commentary. That's what you put in is rubric. That's men speaking. And the black, that is the medjunetcher, the divine words, the inspired words, the words of God. They have to be written in a different type of ink. And so you have a sort of, uh, it's sort of a stereo effect here. You see two worlds. When you see a, uh, an Egyptian manuscript, the red is human speaking, and the black is divine inspiration speaking. And here he talks about that language. And notice he says, the Jews had had this, uh, this kind of, remember, like the witch of Eindor, and uh, well, of course, resembling very much as the witches of Macbeth, who speak in rhymes, as you know, thrice to thine, and thrice to thine, and thrice to thee, to make up nine, peace the charms wound up. That sort of hocus pocus. And notice he refers to it here. The Jews, for their works, were works of darkness. It's the sort of thing. Uh, Tell me, you secret black and midnight hags, what is to do? Remember, he calls them the fiend. Calls them the fiend that lies like truth. He calls Satan that. And they, these are the witches in Macbeth. Come out, you know. <clears throat> and yet, it's strange. And oft times, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. Win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequences. They win us with honest trifles, telling our fortunes. No. And he says, notice. The instruments of darkness, says Shakespeare, and it calls the works were the works of darkness. I don't prophesy that way, he says. I'm not going to give it to them, because that's the way the Jews wanted it, and I'm not going to give it to them that way. And, but he's, I write that they may know the judgments of God that come upon all nations. Now, this is a prophetic section we're going into here. He's going to prophesy what's going to happen, uh, not only up to the time the Book of Mormon is revealed, but thereafter, so we can check on that part. See? Now he says, the words, because of the words of Isaiah, notice in the fourth verse, because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, nevertheless they are plain unto those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. Now, but I give you a prophecy according to the spirit which is in me. Now notice he says, I shall prophesy according to the plainness which has been with me. He doesn't use rhymes. He doesn't use the matter. Well, some great ones. He's going to do as Prospero did. He says, when Prospero gave up his magical prophecy and so forth. But this rough magic I now jure. And when I have required some music, as even now I do, to work its charm upon those for whom this something is meant, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the air, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. He's getting rid of all his works of darkness. Prospero had been this, a great prophet, is here, a, a great magician, a great wizard. This sort of thing, and of course, Teresius comes out and in, in uh, 
right at the beginning of the Oedipus, when he first appears, he stares right straight at the audience, you see. And he says this, he's not talking to people on the stage. It's Sophocles speaking here as the priest, you see, Sophocles was a priest. All of you know nothing, he says, and then he, he gives his charms which throw everybody into conniption fit. Well, that is, uh, he bothers Oedipus, who throws him off, who kicks him out, actually. But you notice, I shall prophesy according to plainness. Yea, my soul delighteth in the words of Isaiah. I know the Jews do understand these things at Jerusalem. Uh, the Jews do understand these things of the prophets. There is none other people that understand them. See, the Jew, only the Jews understand that particular idiom they talk in. Then he says, but I have not noticed the sixth verse here. He says, but I have not taught my people according to that. See, the Jews have strayed. He left just before Jerusalem was destroyed. I, Nephi, have not taught my children after the manner of the Jews. But behold, I of myself have dwelt at Jerusalem, wherefore I know. See, he has the cultural background. He, he knows the setting and how they do it. The Jewish influence, of course, in this was one thing. See, there's been a, everything has been lost in the eastern United States. The most advanced, the most civilized are in the Mississippi Valley <coughs> and in the eastern United States, Indian. More advanced, more civilized even than those in the southwest who, who, uh, who built cities and so forth. The, the Pueblos, they call that because they're city Indians. But uh, the early founding fathers, for example, Jefferson and uh, Franklin and Washington, were not only very fond and very close to the Indians, they were often visited by them. They would often come, especially visit Washington, the great fight father, and live with him and talk with him. And, and they were all convinced, those men, that these people were that close to, well, to use the Arabic way, they, they were that close. Well, this Hopi says this. They say, Hopi this way, Momona this way. We're like this. No, see, well, we're not that way anymore. <coughs> but the... Uh, but they were much impressed, but of course that's all gone now, we don't know. But the Hebrew connections uh, they used to be found, there's, there's a very interesting book here. I suppose I should put it on reserve. It was written in 1820, see, before the Book of Mormon. It's Boudino, a star in the West. And he gives the accounts of all the earliest contacts between the, the people living on the coast and the Indians living back down uh, east of the Appalachians and in the Mississippi Valley before white man ever came to them. And the, the, the first people to go in there, men like Abraham Wood and so forth, they went in and settled with the Indians. They were very Jewish, they said. All the, everything gave that, that strong impression. Whereas other people, uh, like the Navajos, give a strong uh, Mongolian, uh, Mongol background and so forth. Well, they're, they're very mixed up. We mentioned that before. The Book of Mormon has a lot to say about that, too. But he's talking about to his audience now. I proceed with my own prophecy, he says in the seventh. He that supposeth that they are not unto them, they are to my own people. You don't, needn't suppose, you see, they are of worth unto the children of men, and need not suppose that they are not unto them. Unto them will I speak, those that say these prophecies are not important. I'm speaking to you, he says, and I'm speaking to my own people. I'm talking about the last days, in the last days they shall understand them. Woe to the generation that does understand them, because it'll be the last days. In the old 1957 priesthood manual, they call the post of the Book of Mormon, which is on reserve here, uh, I put a, uh, questions after every lesson they asked me to put, put in questions, so I put in questions. And one of the questions was, woe to the generation that understands the Book of Mormon. And boy, did that get the phone ringing off the hook, you see, they're all asking, didn't you mean woe to the generation that does not understand the Book of Mormon? Well, don't fool yourself. My generation, when I was a kid, we didn't understand it at all. I mean, we took it as a romance and this sort of thing, uh, glamorous, we tried to get interest in Hill Camorra and that sort of thing. but. Uh, we didn't under, it seemed overdrawn, it seemed too extravagant. Nations don't actually wipe each other out completely, the way the Jaredites do, or disappear completely, the way the Nephites do, or end in everlasting war, the way the, Lab the Lamanites did, and so forth. Things like that don't happen. People aren't that cruel, they're not, they're not that excessively wicked. Such, such terrible uh, upheavals of nature don't happen. Of course, by that time, however, there had been such things as Krakatoa, and people decided that pretty big things did happen. But it was the... It was the Victorian idea of a slow, gradual, steady, natural development of everything, nothing much to worry about. What a different picture now, you see. When you understand the Book of Mormon, you know what it's talking about, see. You recognize it. And when you recognize what's going on, is what's going on in your world, oh, yo, yo, it's time to beware and look out. Of course, the Book of Mormon is for, for us and for the generation that understands it. And now here comes a very important thing. He's talking about Jerusalem. The Book of Mormon has a lot to say about Jerusalem as the central city that's, that gets destroyed and uh, then is rebuilt again. Notice, even so, as one generation hath been destroyed among the Jews because of iniquity, so even so have they been destroyed from generation to generation. Showing that destruction doesn't mean wiped out to the last man. Destruction means destruel. 
destructured, broken, shattered, scattered, and so forth. From generation to generation, never has any of them been destroyed, save it's been warned. They've been foretold them by the prophets, and they paid no attention, of course. Wherefore, it has been told them concerning the destruction which should come upon them immediately after my father left Jerusalem. 587 is the date given to it now. The date was moved around a lot, but that's where it's finally settled, which was shortly after, see, just 13 years after he left Jerusalem. And uh, though, of course, it was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar in 597, and then, five, and then he went back again, and then, uh, and then uh, Zedekiah tried a revolution, uh, rather Zedekiah, and uh, he put Zedekiah on the throne, you see. And so back he came and really destroyed it the second time, wiped it out. But they hardened their hearts and wouldn't listen, and according to prophecy they have been destroyed. But they shall return again. Next verse, they shall return. And this is the situation when they return. They shall have wars and rumors of wars. Boy, have they had that, and do they have it. And they will crucify the Lord. They're talking about the, the wars, of course, the time of the Romans, and, uh, and between them, and uh, after the Old Testament times, Second Temple. And then it tells about the Lord after he's risen from the dead and manifested self, himself unto his people, unto as many as will believe on his name. And that's an important limitation, as we'll see. Wherefore, the Jews shall be scattered among all nations. Well, this has all happened. Of course, anybody could know that in Joseph Smith's day, but now it goes on and tells us a few things. And, uh, and until they believe, they shall be persuaded to believe in Christ, the Son of God, and the atonement which is infinite over all mankind. He talks about the atonement here, and then the Lord will set his hand a second time to restore his people from their lost and fallen state. Wherefore, he will proceed to do a marvelous work and, among, and a wonder among the children of men. The reestablishing of Jerusalem. Now, this is a, a question I never, never talked about in the class before. But since I've done a lot of work on it, I might as well cash in on it someday, finally. <laughs> So this is from the, I, I went into it in considerable detail. It was reprinted in Jerusalem as a, as a sort of pamphlet book. But this is from the Encyclopedia Judaica. It's from the ninth volume. And this is just the last part of the article. It's a long article on Christian Jerusalem. And uh, now this is about the restoration, the reformation of Jerusalem, coming back to Jerusalem after 1830. And what has happened there? It's been a very interesting thing. The great reformers, especially Luther and Calvin, mildly condemned pilgrimages. You should not go to Jerusalem, they said, uh, but they didn't do it very roughly. Well, let me have some. First of all, I better let me be read uh, what President John Taylor said about that. Here, this is something from the, the Journal of Discourse. I don't know what volume. I, uh, huh? I say I don't know what volume. I have to find out. <laughs> this is just one I just happened to come across. It's a sort of a loose one, unfortunately. I don't have the following page, and I shouldn't even bother with it now, except it's very much to the point. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, I remember some time ago having a conversation with Baron Rothschild, a Jew, a Jew to be sure. Who was Baron Rothschild? You know who he was, founder of the Rothschild banking family, the richest family, the richest man in the world in the 19th century. He was the one that financed World War I. For the English. I mean, he was everything. Uh, he was Frenchman, French originally, and the Rothschilds still go. You know, they, they raise wine. One, they're, and they're still fabulously rich. <laughs> but he was the, the richest man in the world. A classic Jewish joke. A man weeping, what do you read? A, a Jew in New York weeping, what do you read? The notice in the paper. What are you weeping for? Isaac, he says, well, I, Baron Rothschild died. Well, what are you weeping for? He was no re a relation of yours. He says, that's just why I'm weeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the great reform. Oh, we're going to read this one. I was showing him the temple here. Baron Rothschild was visiting Salt Lake, and he said, Elder Taylor, what do you mean by this temple? What is the object of it? Why are you building it? Said I, your fathers had among them prophets who revealed to them the mind and will of God, and we have among us prophets who revealed to us the mind and will of God as they did. One of your prophets said, The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, but who may abide the day of his coming? For he shall sit as a refiner's fire and a purifier of silver. Now, said I, sir, will you point to me a place on the face of this earth where God has a temple, said he, I do not know of any. You remember the words of your prophet that I have just quoted? Said he, yes, I know the prophet said that, but I do not know of any temple anywhere. Do you consider that this is that temple? Oh, no, sir, not, not at all, he said. This is not. Well, what temple? 
What is this temple for? Said I, the Lord has told us to build this temple so that we may administer therein baptisms from our dead, which I explained to him, and also to perform some of the sacred matrimonial alliances and covenances that we believe in, that are rejected by the world generally, but are not among the purest, but which are among the purest, most exalting, and ennobling principles that God has ever revealed to man. Well then, this is not our temple, says uh, Rochelle, Baron Rochelle. No, but, said I, you will build a temple, for the Lord has shown us, among other things, that the Jews have quite a role to perform in the latter days, that all the things spoken of by your old prophets will be fulfilled, that you will be gathered to the old Jerusalem, and that, and that's where the page ends, so we'll resume uh, <laughs> the article. But you see what the position is, that the Jews are going to have their own show, and we have ours, and we don't, we don't interfere with them, we don't mingle with them at all. Uh, I mean, we, we don't... Uh, seek to counsel them. They're doing their own. So here, I say the great reformers uh, uh, condemned pilgrimages to Jerusalem, just as all the fathers of the fourth century condemned pilgrimages to Jerusalem. They didn't like it because it looked like bad faith in Rome, that you, if you had to go to Jerusalem to be inspired, I thought Rome was supposed to be the center thing. They tried to stop it, and it never worked, because people would be drawn to Jerusalem. It's an irresistible magnet, and has always been. And uh, as Roussel says, they were determined adversaries of pilgrimages, but uh, they imitated them in their old Hebrew aspect. Luther says he can, con in his works, Luther says he can conceive of honest pilgrimages of the old type, and he's impressed by the unique holiness of Jerusalem. And Calvin's objection to the pil pilgrimage was primarily to the physical impossibility of gathering the saints at Jerusalem. He says it's a, uh, a uh, Calvin writes in a work called The Minor Prophets, it's impossible to have a city of Jerusalem be built. For one thing, he says, it's described in the Bible, the New Jerusalem will be 15 miles long. Now, what city could ever be 15 miles long, you see? Well, he wasn't born in Los Angeles, was he? Uh, no, uh, it's a small city today that, uh, that isn't at least 15 miles long. But that was his objection. It was a physical one. He says, uh, no city would be big enough to hold uh, all the people that would have to go back to Jerusalem. That, that couldn't be possible. Well, they had very small cities in those days. It was this was necessary to counteract the uh, tendency to apocalyptic excitement, see, with ref deference to the Jews attendant on the Reformation's intensive preoccupation with the Bible. Uh, people like Reuchlin, for example, in getting deep into the Old Testament, uh, committed the people to more serious study and more sympathetic study of the Jews. And so we have uh, Luther's works also, I, and Calvin, I quote quite a number of passages from Luther and Calvin here, in which they have this great respect, but they have to hold it down. We mustn't give too much to the Jews. We mustn't give them too much credit. They're through. Their temple fell. They're gone. They will never, the only way they can possibly be saved or do anything else is to be converted again. And this was the belief that if they were ever to go back to Jerusalem, it could only be as converted Christians. And so this was the, the tendency to sympathize with them, but, and, and both Luther and, and Calvin tried to check it. Uh, as various groups of enthusiasts took to building their own local New Jerusalems. Throughout Europe, everybody, with the Reformation, everybody started building his own New Jerusalem. There are all sorts of versions of it, uh, versions of it uh, or preparing to migrate to Palestine for the, ta for the task. Here, the, uh, well, the Mennonites, for example, had, and the Anabaptists, uh, remember, in, in Münster, they were to build their own Jerusalems, their own Zions, Zions and Jerusalem springing up all over the place with various cults, the like. And then there were some of them prepared to migrate to Palestine to rebuild the Jerusalem. They were to be the pilgrims back there. That John Evelyn, his famous diary, John Evelyn's diary is about that. You see, he tells you all about going back to Jerusalem. And George Fox, who wrote the Book of Martyrs, in his journal, he tells us his intention of going back. They should go back and rebuild Jerusalem. The Christians should do it. See? So this, this was the project uh, all throughout the 17th century. They're all writing mostly in the 17th century. Their own Jerusalem or prepare to migrate to, to Palestine. Protestant pilgrims to Jerusalem from the 16th to the 20th centuries always condemned the mummery of the older pilgrimages, but they indulged in their own brand of ecstatic dramatization. They would do that all the time. The, uh, did I, oh, this preparing to go back. Wait a minute. Build their own local Jew. I, I skipped a sentence here. Uh, such groups flourished down through the 19th century. I think especially of Jung Stilling. I'll put him in here because he's a remarkable person. I think I had a note on Jung Stilling. Oh yes, here we have it. Uh, he was Jung Stilling. He well, lived in southern Germany and uh, Bavaria, and uh, he got together. He believed that the 
that they should get together and go and build a new Jerusalem. They should go settle Zion again. And he was granted a million acres in Bessarabia by Tsar Alexander III, who was an idealist. And his people got in their covered wagons and started moving toward the east. The Bessarabia is on the coast of the Black Sea. And halfway there, he had a vision and a dream. And he said, no, we're making a mistake. The building of Zion is not going to be moving in this direction. It's going to come later, and it's moving the other direction. It's going to be toward the west, and it will be led by a man who bears my name, Jung. It was a very interesting vision he had, you see. So they gave it up, and he went back, because the real, the, the real settling was to be in the West and led by a man called Jung. But Jung Stilling was a remarkable man. There's some, uh, Bentz, incidentally, uh, Professor Bentz, uh, who, um, he, what's his name, Edward? I think it's Edward Bentz, yes, who was visited here, uh, has written about that, very interesting. He has written interestingly about the Mormons, too. I mean, he's very sympathetic, he's visited us here. And we have Christian Hoffman and Johann Lange and the Jerusalem Friends of Temples. These are various movements of people going back to Jerusalem. She's trying to rebuild it in the 19th century. And uh, Sir Henry Finch was, well, wait, here we're back in the time of James I in the 17th century, in 1620. James I threw Sir Henry Finch into, the, into jail because he called for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and take over, he says, complete temporal dominion over the whole world. And this plan had considerable influence for, two, for over 300 years, this, the plan of Sir Henry Finch, for which he was imprisoned, you see. The, uh, the Protestant uh, James I jailed him because that looked like uh, heresy. Everybody gets interested in rebuilding Jerusalem, first with the Reformation, then comes the 19th century. Now, the Catholic, I don't want to miss too many things here. They, they talked of it, see, the, the, uh, Protestants talked about the older pilgrimages as mummery. They were superstitious and so forth, and they were very interesting. That was a marvelous account of them. But, uh, but they had their own ecstatic brand of dramatization. Uh, the Roman Catholics saw the uh, real thing in every object they saw. For example, uh, they were always collecting nails from the original cross and wood from the original cross all over the place. And, uh, well, it's like the, like the Turin Shroud, and, uh, which the, the church has now admitted is uh, 14th century. But they would, they would put on display such things as the farthing that the woman lost in the, in the uh, remember, in the, the lost farthing, the lost penny, in the uh, parable of the Lord, where he says the woman searches the house for the lost penny, uh, finds it. Well, they, the lost penny was on display in Jerusalem. You could see the penny the woman lost. Those were just a parable. parable of the, but the Catholics made everything very literal that way and identified all the uh, archaeological remains with the very objects mentioned in the Bible. They had everything. And the Protestants were no less de zealous. They detected the proof of the scriptures in every type of object observed in the Holy Land. The Quakers insist, and Fox, who was a Quaker, George Fox says, insist, we cannot own no other, neither outward Jerusalem, yet they risked life and limb to reach the physical Jerusalem. It's funny. See, they denied that they want, that, that this superstition, uh, that they were affected by it at all. They weren't going to, to go back as pilgrimage. This, this had happened for centuries, of course. That's what the Crusades were about, getting back to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple. And yet they risked life and limb to reach the physical Jerusalem. And... Uh, Purchase, a famous work called Purchase of Pilgrims, in several volumes. We, naturally, we have it here. It famous. Hope you've all read Purchase Pilgrims. He says, to ascribe sanctity to the place is Jewish. That's wrong. Yet he was a pilgrim. He insisted on going there. And others who poured contempt on the holy places and rites were transported at the site when they saw one. There are some good examples here. Uh, Edward Robertson, who was the first person to make any scientific in 1840, first person to make any scientific study of Palestine at all. Before that, not, it was fantastic. Nobody knew what it was like at all. And so Joseph Smith couldn't have picked up anything before 1840, their, their Orientalism. We mentioned that later. Now, this is typical. Now, Edward Robertson, being very scientific, but he met with some of the elders of his church. And he says he was overwhelmed by the coincidence of time, place, and number when 12 American missionaries met in the large upper room in Jerusalem. Now, they met in Jerusalem. I ah, see, there's something to that. The same symbol as the Lord meeting in the upper chamber with the 12. See, he would have nothing to do with any superstition or anything like that. But, but when it happens to him, he sees there's something very special there. And Philip Schaff, who edited the Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia, the big Presbyterian classic Encyclopedia of Religion, which we refer to, it's a good one. When Schaff 
He says he abhors the superstition and mummery of pilgrimage, but he went and immersed himself ten times in the Jordan, he says, and I almost imagine I was miraculously delivered from rheumatism. You see? <laughs> he is free of superstition, Professor Schaaf is, but he allowed himself to be dunked ten times, why ten times, you see, in the Jordan, and he says, I almost imagined I was delivered miraculously from rheumatism. You see? So the people are always playing with this. They can't leave Jerusalem alone. For one thing, it's, it's quite romantic, you understand that, and that, we get that with Chateau Briand. We'll have to put his name on the board. Let me see what have we got here. Yes, uh, Chateaubriand's much publicized visit to Jerusalem in 1806. This started Orientalism, Orientalism, Chateaubriand described it, but Chateaubriand's famous uh, literateur. Uh, he visited Jerusalem and, and wrote up Palestine. He gave it this glamour, this Orientalism, this, this Scheherazade, a uh, picture that was that lasted for a hundred years. They didn't have any real idea of what it was like. It's, it's, it's been uh, evident ever since. Everybody over rom romanticizes it, over glamorizes it, though some things can't be over glamorized. But uh, he combined religious, literary, and intellectual interests and established a romantic appeal of the Holy Land that has lasted almost through the century. The uh, Um, what do I cite? Gotta be on a Chateaubriand here, just a second here. Oh, no wonder I'm turning backwards here. The wrong one. Here we are. He's, this is a very interesting thing. F. Basson, who's made a very thorough work of Chateaubriand in the Holy Land, uh, published quite recently, he says, all the French travelers to Jerusalem between 1800 and 1850 represent an Orient de fantasy, represent an, a completely fantastic idea of the Orient. And everybody followed along with that. Now remember, the Book of Mormon was written 20 years before 1850, but everybody was, was strapped with that. Nobody could see the real Orient. It's the real Orient you get in the Book of Mormon, you see. This, you don't, any of the glamorous Orientalism that people were putting into, into romances in, in the manner of Chateaubriand. So, uh, when Jerusalem was thrown open to the West in the 1830s, the first time, it was by 1830 when Muhammad Ali became the ruler of, of Islam. He was the most powerful man in Egypt, reformed everything, and he opened Egypt, which is under, not Egypt, uh, Palestine, to outside travel. And European and American missionaries hastened to the spot ambitious with ambitious projects of converting the Jews with an eye to the fulfillment of prophecy in the ultimate restoration of Jerusalem. In 1835, church missions to the Jews set up in Jerusalem. There were very many of them. We have some examples. And a classical study of this by Toynbee. You all know Ar Arnold Toynbee. He's not the big noise he was a few years ago uh, when he, uh, some people thought, Toynbee. A study of history, or a study of history in nine volumes, I think it was. He was a Cambridge man. One person who knowed him, knew him very well uh, was uh, Arthur Henry King. Arthur, sorry, he was a close friend of Toynbee. He says, he wasn't a phony, but uh, very near. Uh, but he has an interesting thing to say. He says his, par his grandparents were those that participated in this missionary movement to Jerusalem. They were going to, to go back and refound Jerusalem as a Christian uh, center, as a Christian Jerusalem of the millennium. That was their idea. He says the only people that weren't sensibly moving in the direction of the Jerusalem were the poor deluded Mormons who thought they should go west and have their own Zion while they left it to the Jews to refound Jerusalem. They thought the Jews would found Jerusalem again. Of course, they turned out to be right. It was the Jews who, who resettled Jerusalem, and, and not all these many efforts, very expensive, uh, fabulously uh, financed and so forth by people like Rothschild to go back. Of course, his money had a lot to do with Zionism, uh, Herzl and the rest. Well, then they, they hastened and they were all going to, to set up their, their missions there. As I say, Toynbee actually scolds the Mormons for doing a silly thing, not the sensible thing. They went in the wrong direction to found Zion and left it to the Jews to found to reestablish Jerusalem. Even the ill-starred Anglo-Lutheran bishopric of 1841, of 1841 had that in view. A very th interesting thing ha happened in 1841. The, the, the Episcopalians and the Lutherans were, were competing for it, and they, they got together. And, and said that they would build, make a common bishopric. And they, they appointed a converted Polish Jew to be Bishop of Jerusalem in the church, in the United Evangelical, well, United Episcopal and, uh, and Lutheran 
a church in Jerusalem. And later on in the, in the land, the, the Kaiser gave them the land. You see, what dominates Jerusalem in all the pictures, you know, is that big tower on the top, the highest point. Well, that's the Lutheran church that, uh, that Kaiser Wilhelm II gave to, uh, well, built in Jerusalem as, as the Lutheran. Well, he comes a little later, you see. This, this is just the generation before. And, uh, and we get this in the, well, it was, it was Gladstone and Bunsen who put their heads together for this. Of course, I knew that all along. Uh, Bunsen, you see, was the German prime minister, and Gladstone was the English prime minister under Victoria. And they decided to put an end to the squabbling and to make a common cause. And it was they who selected the new bishop of Jerusalem, I say, who was a converted Polish Jew, and he'd be the bishop. Well, that, that flopped. That didn't work at all. And uh, Newman denounced it passionately later on as, as a plan of base concession to the Jews and the Protestants. John Henry Newman, remember the, in his apology. He's the great Catholic convert. The Newman clubs you find all over, universities all over the country represent the Catholic students there. Well, Newman really, really fought it because the Catholic Church has always fought to return to Jerusalem here. See why. Uh, he indicated the stand of the Roman Church, which in 1847 they decided to catch up. So in 1847, the Catholic Church appointed a resident patriarch of Jerusalem. And uh, this move, says Moray, counterbalances as much as possible the influence of Russian schismatics and German Protestants. Everybody was out for grab, up for grabs now. The Russian schismatics, he calls them as a Catholic writer, Murray, saying, it counterbalances the Russians' attempt at getting the holy places and the German Protestants. So we set up, in 1847, the Catholics set up their own, uh, their own bishop presiding here. Uh, get down here. He called him the resident patriarch. Now, this, the mind, mounting rivalry became terrible and became ferocious, and it ends, come, ends very soon in a horrible thing that happens. The mounting rivalry, the missions and foundations that followed, France uses her office. In 1553, Francis I, the rival of Henry VIII and so forth, the flamboyant king, Francis I signed the capitulations in which he, it gave France the right to protect, under the Franciscans, the right to protect the holy places of Jerusalem. It was the privilege of France to protect the holy places of Jerusalem and uh, to take over. And of course, it would became a political plum uh, a little later. And it was renewed in 1740. And to advance her interests in the Orient, the Louis Napoleon III, Louis Napoleon the Little, uh, decided to really go in and occupy the, and take him because he, uh, he claimed on the, on the basis of the capitulations of Francis I, 1553, 1740, that France had exclusive right to protect the holy places in Jerusalem. Well, the Russian pilgrimages have always been the most ardent. They've been coming there since the 10th century. They were the most fervid pilgrims. And uh, the Russians weren't going to let that happen at all. And this brought on the Franco, uh, this, this uh, brought on the Crimean War between France and 1854 and caused the death and misery of mil millions. The vanity of Louis Napoleon. He was obliged. It was to oblige his Catholic constituents, to, though he was an atheist, see, to reactivate French claims to holy places which France had long neglected and the Russians long cherished. And what he calls was the foolish affair of the holy places. He says brought about the my land, uh, brought about the terrible Crimean War and its portentous chain of disasters and uh, and calamities. In the second half of the 19th century, major powers and churches were stimulated by mutual rivalry to seek commanding positions in Jerusalem. Now they were going to try not to protect the holy places, but to found eleemosynary institutions, hospitals, going way back to the Crusades, you see the Hospitallers, and the, you have the, uh, the Templars, who were to protect pilgrims to the temple, things like that. They go back, it's an old tradition, so everybody starts founding his, his hospitals, his libraries, schools, the things that we found where we want to get a foothold someplace. And, uh, but they're charitable, eleemosynary institutions, but they were backed by the major powers, so they go in in a big way and start pushing each other, and uh, over which they retained control. See, the government retained control over this. Uh, somebody would fund or finance a school, but the government would contain it, and they started moving in on each other. Beyond the hard facts of geometry and economics, the religious significance of the city it was the one that exerted the steady pressure on the policies of all the great powers. And the, I like the story of the German Kaiser, Wilhelm II. See, he tells us here, I think I have a reference to that here. Uh, wait a minute, I, I skipped. Uh, well, about the, the Alamosinary ones, I forgot this one that 
uh, uh, Queen Eugenie, remember Napoleon III's Queen, uh, Queen Eugenie. We don't have the Eugenie hats anymore. She was the wife of Henry, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Queen Napoleon and Napoleon III. The, uh, and uh, the one who tried to take over Mexico sent Maximilian, sent Maximilian over there to become king of Mexico and lost that. But Eugenia had a grand project. She said, let all the crown heads of Europe pitch in and make a charitable contribution and we'll have one big common charitable fund, like a united fund in Palestine to take care of everything. Because she had this idealistic plan. Well, that fell through. Uh, and uh, Almoray says, the French government saw in the pilgrimage as the force to be utilized in penetrating the penetration of the Orient. Even the anti-clerical party supported them accordingly. <coughs> And it was to meet the growing power of France and Russia, which established the Jerusalem bishop, that the Protestants of England and Germany were appealed to for support, quote, in the name of national interest and prestige. So everybody is getting into the act. Russia, England, France, Germany. If you're a, if you're a great power, you have to be. In, and that was ever since the assizes of Jerusalem. That's so. I remember we went back to Baldwin of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, who, who represented all the Europeans. They were all intermarried back there and the kingdom of Jerusalem until it fell. Uh, to, uh, well, after that it was to Saladin. Getting the notes are longer than the text, that's why I jump back and forth here. Well, the German Kaiser, it was nice. When he was a little kid, he said, his Aunt Louisa gave him a, a beautiful uh, wooden model of the New Jerusalem. It was one where you put together blocks, golden domes and houses and walls and everything. You could build it was a big thing. And he used to play with it by the hour. And of course, this fascinated him with Jerusalem, with, with its golden domes and its towers and its churches and everything. It was a model Jerusalem uh, on, a, on a grand scale for a kid to play with. And this set his, his heart on it. And uh, then when Herzl, the founder of the Zionism, you know Alexander Herzl? Was Alexander Herzl? Yes. The founder of Zionism, uh, in 1898, he recognized uh, William II, the Kaiser, that's a World War I Kaiser, you see, quote, as an emperor of peace, making great entry into his, eter into his eternal city. The Kaiser went to Jerusalem, and he dressed up in a complete suit of white armor, and he got on a white charger, and he entered through the Jaffa Gate in all magnificence to liberate Jerusalem. All the ideas of him when he was a little kid, he always dreamed of the time when he would come as as Lohengrin on a white charger, very Wagnerian, see, uh, dressed completely in white armor, very typical of the German Kaiser, entering to deliver Jerusalem. He was a very pious man, incidentally. He was a, he was a, very, a very religious man, Kaiser Wilhelm II. And uh, then uh, oh, he dreamed of converting the Jews. That was the, and so he was right in with Herzl there, who was the Zionist. But what, what uh, spoiled it all, According to Herzl was the arrogance of his staff. Of course, not, nothing more arrogant than a Prussian Junker, and that's, that was his staff. They were all uh, composed of Prussian Junkers. They spoiled the whole thing, so it broke through because of the arrogance of Prussia, which led to World War I. I mean, it was unspeakable arrogance as far as that goes. Well, uh, then, but he did do this. He was the one that built that, you know, that tall church, that high church, the biggest thing. Whenever you see a picture of Jerusalem at a distance, you always see that big tower sticking up. That's the Lutheran church, the tower that sticks up. That made the Catholics mad, but he appeased them to appease his Catholics. There are a lot of Catholics in the empire after all. And uh, so he gave them the Dormitium. That was the house in Jerusalem, the oldest house in Jerusalem, surviving from the time of Christ, supposedly the house of John Mark's mother. And that was greatly prized, and he gave that to the Catholics. The Catholics got the Dormitium, and the Roma and the Lutherans got the big church on the top of the hill. And he proclaimed pro a Protestant unity the Kaiser, by the dedication of the great Jerusalem church and the patronage of Palestinian Zionism, which was thwarted by his advisors, as I say. And then the taking of Jerusalem by Allen, Allenby in 1917. You all remember that. You remember you, uh, you've read uh, Lawrence of Arabia. The Seven Pillars of Wisdom talks about this. And he was hailed, Allenby was hailed throughout the Christian world as the deliverer of, of, of Zion as the fulfillment of prophecy, and the Muslims deplored it as a Christian crusade against their holy city, and that was the famous General Allenby, and uh, good old 1970. This has been a basic thing. I remember we, we really hailed this in the church in Raid. I remember my, my parents having, everyone was quite exhilarated about it. Uh, 
this shows that the, the prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And it was a very important step now, because then came the Balfour Declaration that the Jews would have the right to return to Jerusalem, and uh, then Zionism had a, well, they had, had the green light. They thought they did, but they had an awful lot of trouble. World War II is followed by increasing interest in Jerusalem as a center of ecumenical Christianity. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, in 1928, for example, the, there was a Jerusalem meeting which recalled not inaptly the period of the great ecumenical council. They started this ecumenical uh, movement already in 1928 by a meeting of many churches in Jerusalem in 1928. Then this gave impetus for the creation of an international committee on the Christian approach to the Jews founded at that time and established in uh, Jerusalem, that's right, in Jerusalem in 1951. No, that was the 19, that was the, oh, that was earlier. Because then the YMCA, this is just an example of what goes on, you see. The YMCA International Prayer Week at Jerusalem in 1951. Everybody else wants to get into the act. Then the Grand Mufti wanted to get into the tea. He was a... He was something. Boy, he was going to stop the Jews at any rate. So he gave a, a tea inviting all the Christians, going to unite all the religions except the Jews in 1955, I see. And then there was a World Conference of Pentecostal Organizations. They held their great meeting in 1960 at Jerusalem. They're all expressive of the idea. We want to go back and be the found, re-founders of Jerusalem. We've got to unite and keep, keep Jerusalem Christian here. The, then in... Uh, through the old religious and national rivalries of long standing and great variety continued to flourish, astonishingly set forth way back John of Würzburg in the Middle Ages that still survives in, in Jerusalem. American Jesuits from Baghdad and Presbyterian mis ministers grouped around the American University of Beirut, where I spent some time. Uh, they multiplied schools and attracted students by the assurance of employment in Yankee en enterprise, says a resentful French observer talking about it. Today, the Benedictine Order seeks recruits in all countries, particularly in the United States, for work in Jerusalem. Uh, the Catholics decided to throw themselves into it now. But in 1948, after the Jewish War, President Truman recognized Jerusalem, and he sent back his Jerusalem, uh, his, his advisor, rather his uh, representative, J.G. MacDonald, to go back to Jerusalem and give them our blessing. And he had a conversation with the Pope on the way, and uh, the Pope didn't like it at all. Oh boy, this will never happen. This will never do. He said. Uh, he went back the Va in, 19 in the same year. The Vatican, to counter that, appealed for the growth of Jerusalem as a universal Christian religious, cultural, and edu educational center. Everything to keep the Jews out. Make it universally Christian. Catholics were willing to concede that. The mixture of culture and religious interest is apparent in the pilgrimage of the Holy Year 1950. The Baptist pilgrimage of 2,500 members in 1955 and, quote, the arrival of ever-increasing numbers of interdenominational and study groups. The scholarly emphasis is seen in the founding of auxiliary residence for the Pontifical Biblical Institute at Jerusalem. And uh, that one's the one that Professor, what's his name, was in charge of. And amusingly demonstrated by the impeccable good taste, we're told, of the Bishop of New York, who notes the World Wars I and II both began as crusades but quickly dropped the illusion. So let's stop making a crusade here, he says. Then, uh, then we go on. We get a more sophisticated air here, in other words, that's what I was talking about. Even the old and vexing problem of the priority of Jerusalem, mother of churches, over other Christian bishoprics, is now approached in a spirit of mutual concession with respect for the autonomy of various bishoprics in Jerusalem. Uh, the, uh, this liberal attitude may be a response to what is regarded by some Christian circles as the Jewish challenge to the basic Christian thesis that only Christians can possess the new Jerusalem. Uh, and this uh, very interesting writings on this. The Christians are beginning to yield ground on this. One of them writing here says, by the dramatic entry of Israel, the Christian tradition of the Holy Land has been violently disrupted. Israel spoiled everything by just coming in and taking it over. This is the Bishop Blythe, who takes comfort in the thought that Israel is fulfilling scriptures in many ways, even unconsciously. But they were generally arrived, uh, here's one person, generally alarmed by the idea that the Jews should come back to Jerusalem, uh, and uh, others, C.N. Williams' book, The Holy Spirit, he says he's just nonplussed. It shouldn't happen. That's not the way prophecy was supposed to be at all, he says. He, he goes into a, quite a tizzy about that. Uh, 
While the great powers for over a century cautiously sought to exploit the energies of Zionism and its sympathizers, they wanted to do that, way back in 1838, Shaftesbury got Palmerston to appoint a British vice consul in Jerusalem charged with protection of the Jews generally. So way back in 1838, the Britain wanted to get in on the ground floor and protect Jews coming back to, to Palestine. And they, remember, that was just after the year after Orson Hyde had blessed the land for the return of the Jews, the year after Shaftesbury and Palmerston set up the British vice consul in Jerusalem for the protection of Jews generally. In 1840, they sought cooperation with the Russian decabrists, with the Polish liberationists, with the French statesmen as a part of a widespread liberation movement. The Anglo-Lutheran bishopric of the following year, we mentioned that, 1841, denounced by Newman implicitly because it made implicit concessions to the Jews in Palestine who, were evinced, who evinced a deep interest in Zionism and arranged for Herschel's audience with the Kaiser, which became so sensational. Zionism became a question with which European politics must reckon and so forth. And so it goes here and, uh, well, let's just finish up now. Uh, the great powers for over a century, yes, it's now openly conceded that the Jews might indeed rebuild the city, though only as potential Christians. If they become Christian, that's fine, you see. Though some Christians are even willing to waive that proviso, including Albright and so forth. And uh, way back, Chateaubriand, way back in his day, found the Jewish community in Jerusalem to be the only wholly admirable and miraculous phenomenon in the city, was that the Jews had settled and were there and were holding their own against the Muslims. The fundamental thesis is so firmly rooted that the progress of Israel is commonly viewed not as a refutation of it, but as a baffling and disturbing paradox. It just should not happen. Because, well, Charles Malik, you remember all Charles Malik of the, uh, in the United Nations so forth, and, and, and President Reagan's representative years ago, way back in the beginning uh, here, Charles Malik had such influence, he's spoken here at the BYU a number of times. And the World Council of Churches, they, they make this official statement. The continued existence of the Jewish people, which does not acknowledge Christ, is a divine mystery. Well, there you are. It is a mystery and a wonderful phenomenon, says Berdajeff, refuting the materialistic and positivistic criterion of history, as does Mr. Toynbee's theory of history to his annoyance. The rivalry is expressed by many of the fathers, and so forth and so on. Well, that's the way it goes in Jerusalem, I think. Wow. Time is up, yes. And this coming back to Jerusalem, see, the point is we're right in the middle of it now. It's never settled. The, uh, the Pope to McDonald says we can never, the Catholic Church can never concede that the Jews should go back because it's against prophecy. The prophecy was, of course, that the New Jerusalem should be built by people who accepted Christ. And, of course, that must be Christians. So this thing has gone on all the time. And the most important things, I've just been reading about these happenings since uh, the Book of Mormon came out, most of them, that is.